Hi everyone. A very good evening and welcome to the Paramal Museum of Art. Um, so as you know, we have public outreach programming as part of all our exhibitions. And as a part of this exhibition, titled Before the Canvas, we've done this very beautiful talk with Dr. Chitra Madhavan, who's going to be talking about temples as repositories of art and culture. So I am just going to start by introducing Dr. Chitra. Uh, Dr. Chitra Madhavan has an MA and MPhil from the Department of Indian History, University of Madras, and a PhD from the Department of Ancient History and Archaeology, University of Mysore. She is the recipient of two postdoctoral fellowships from the Department of Culture, Government of India, and from the Indian Council of Historical Research, New Delhi. She is the author of nine books, History and Culture of Tamil Nadu, two volumes, Vishnu Temples of South India, five volumes, Sanskrit Education and Literature in Ancient and Medieval Tamil Nadu, and Temples of Kanchipuram. She has written the text for a coffee table book, Snapshots of Bygone Era, A Century of Images. Chitra has co-edited a book, South Indian Heritage, an introduction, containing 500 articles on the heritage and culture of South India. She has compiled three books, Kalakshetra, Reflections, uh, Sculpture, Sri Rangam, Heaven on Earth, Splendor of the Devraja Swami Temple. Dr. Chitra has contributed more than 100 articles to the multi-volume Encyclopedia of Hinduism. She delivers lectures on Indian heritage and culture at various places in India and abroad, and also leads heritage tours to places of historic and archaeological importance. So I'd just like to welcome Dr. Chitra here for the talk. A very good evening to all of you. And my thanks to uh, Piramal Museum for uh, inviting me here to Mumbai. And thank you, Sayali, for all the help that you've been doing uh, over the last very many weeks. So for the next one hour, uh, we'll be touring various places in uh, India. We'll be going to different temples, but mostly, mostly to the temples of South India and mostly to the temples of Tamil Nadu because that's my area of uh, research. But I'll start from the very beginning, which is a good place to start. So we are going to a little known cave temple. This is in, a, in Bihar, in a place called Barabar Hills. This is one of the earliest uh, structures of India. This is a cave temple that belongs to approximately the 3rd century BC, when Ashoka was uh, ruling, when the Mauryas were ruling. This is granite. And uh, this is how the cave temples actually look. And that's, that's one cave there. This is another one. This is, this is the main one. Now, we've, we've heard of the Buddhists. We've heard of the Jains. But we haven't heard of a group, many of us may not have heard of a group of people called the Ajivikas, who actually practiced meditation, who lived inside these caves. Uh, there is an inscription that says so. So this is one of the earliest temple, so to speak, uh, without a deity inside. I just want you to see the kind of art um, that they practiced. Now, this is the hard granite wall. So they've made one cut into the rock, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and that's where the door is, when they could so easily have just made this gap for people to go inside. So this is a thing of beauty. And you may wonder what all this, these things sticking out are. Looks good, and we can leave it like that, or we can try to probe and find out why they wanted to have this kind of a very beautiful facade. And the reason is basically because this is one of the earliest stone places of worship, places of meditation. And before this, before this it was all made of wood and it was made of brick. So when you were making a structure out of wood, in those days, we are talking about 2,000 plus years back, you had to have some kind of rafters for keeping the ceiling up. And this was the kind of wooden rafter that was there in the structures pre the Barabar cave temple of the 3rd century BC. So when they started experimenting with stone, mentally they couldn't or didn't want to get out of that wood structure tradition. And therefore they had these rafters made in stone. Let's also understand one thing at the beginning itself, but I will repeat this because I'm fond of repeating. And the reason is that, see, this is something that you're doing 
directly on the wall. Suppose I'm a sculptor and you give me uh, a granite stone this big and ask me to carve it into uh, Nataraja. And as I am chiseling, suppose I make a mistake, I can discard it and I can get another piece of stone and start over again. But in instances like this, you, you don't have a margin for error. You have to get it right first instance and you have to get it right throughout. So as the sculptor was going in and in, if we had made a mistake here, you and I sitting here in Mumbai would be commenting on it and saying, look, this guy made a mistake. But there is absolutely no mistake and see how beautiful this is. Absolutely. Chip, one chip in, the second one here and then the rafters and then goes in and then it goes in like that. And inside it's polished, beautifully polished. So um, this is how it is. And look at these elephants. And they are not all elephants. The other important thing is what we see over here. We can choose to ignore or we can choose to observe and that will help us. So this is what is called a kalash or a kumba. It is a pot-like thing which is kept on top of every temple that is going to be in worship. So without a kalash, the, the worship doesn't happen and that is the consecration ceremony. So when they had made structures out of wood and out of brick, they had placed something on top. Whereas this is not constructed, it's chiseled. They have chiseling inside. And how do you tell people that it's complete and it's a place ready for worship, that it's a place ready for meditation? You can't. So you've put this thing on top just to say that, yes, you can go in now and you can do all the work that you want. So if you look at this, these are all elephants, but we've ignored this specimen here. And this is something called a makara that occurs so very often in Indian art, in the north and in the south. And in the south, it's mostly called the yali. So I'm, I'm jumping from place to place. I'm jumping from century to century. I've tried to make it as uh, chronologically viable as possible. So now we go to Sanchi, the very, very uh, famous stupa over here. And I'm Buddhist. The first was Ajivika. This is Buddhist. And we are going here just to see the four entrances, which are called the Toranas. And these Toranas are so beautiful now, even in their very, very damaged condition. This is how the Toranas look. These are all made of sandstone. And can you imagine the very, very precise work that is done over here? And there is an inscription on one of the Toranas saying that ivory carvers were called to create this because people who work on ivory have very nimble fingers and they have to be so very accurate and the, and the carvings have to be so minute. And they were asked to do this and no wonder it's like this. The, there are a whole lot of stories about the Buddha here, especially the previous lives of the Buddha, which are called the Jataka tales. Much of that is represented over here. So all this is the um, Torana of the Sanchi Stupa, all of this. So beautiful. So now we come closer to Maharashtra and these are your famous um, Ajanta caves. Uh, so very beautiful, uh, ranging from approximately the 2nd to the 5th century AD, 2nd BC to 5th century AD, though this is controversial dating, I know that. And all along the Vaghora River here, you have this. I'm setting the pace for the um, temples that are to come hereafter. And these are also monolithic, rock cut, cave temples, as you all know. And I've taken this from a book by Susan Huntington. And this is how deep inside the caves of Ajanta have been chiseled. Those, the, the ones that I showed you here are the viharas or the dwelling places of the Buddhists. And these are the chaityas where they actually prayed. Everything that is in black over here is stone. And the white part is the cutout ones where they have actually chiseled out the rock. So we can imagine, just for a second, that we are standing here and this whole thing is the rock from top to bottom. And how these people have cut in so precisely that if you stand behind this pillar, you can't see the pillars in front. The alignment is divine. And millimeter for millimeter, each of these pillars is identical. And I'll explain this with the help of some other... Ooh. All right. So this is a chaitya. Now look at the top. They still haven't forgotten the wood rafter tradition. It's here as well. It looks like the inside of a whale. 
And so when you go in here, you can do a circumambulation of the Buddha. You can go right around there. You can go around the pillars. And imagine you're cutting into one piece of stone. So if I am an architect and you ask me to build a row of pillars over here, what I could so easily do is to take out my measuring tape and say one pillar here, few feet away another one, a few feet away another one. And if I get the alignment wrong, suppose I just get the alignment wrong, I can demolish it and I can rebuild it. Here, there is, there is no such provision. You just have to get it right. And you're looking at the blank wall. I'm looking at a wall here and I want a pillar here. So what I have to do is I have to chisel around it. And then as I proceed further, I'm looking at another blank wall. I have to chisel around it and I have to align these two. Now how easy is that? And this is what they have done here in Ajanta. Can you see the space where you can actually go around the Buddha? Um, this is how it is. So there are very many more cave temples in India and these are some of the sculptures that you have. This is the Pari Nirvana of the Buddha. We all know that he attained Nirvana in Bodh Gaya under the Bodhi tree. The Pari Nirvana is the ultimate giving up of the mortal body of the Buddha. Now this is in one of the Chaitya Grihas and it curves around like that. So no photographer can actually get a full length photo of the Buddha because he is seven meters long. Again, I have, I have scanned this from a book by Susan Huntington. So you take it in three different shots and then you stitch them together on the computer. I don't know why this is happening, but this is seven meters long. So that's how, how big it is. And some of the paintings of uh, Ajanta. So now how do temples reflect art and culture? Uh, these are some of the oldest paintings in, of India. And these are made of special technique called fresco, when you're actually painting when the wall is wet. Uh, everything is organic. The plaster on the wall is organic. Your paint is organic. Your paint brush is organic. And it's made with the tail of a, uh, the hair of a squirrel. And just look at the necklace this uh, Bodhisattva uh, Padmapani is wearing, um, mm, pearls with a pendant. We can learn so much about jewelry from these temples. And look at this lady, her costume, her garment, whatever it is that she's wearing with ducks on it. Was it printed? Was it woven? We don't know. A whole lot about jewelry and costumes needs to be explored in the caves of Ajanta and other places as well, and we'll come to them. Here we are now traveling to the south. We are going to the state of Karnataka. We are going deep into a small village called Badami. Um, the ancient name was Vatapi. This was the capital of the Chalukyan dynasty. There's rocky outcrop here, and most of it is, almost all of it is sandstone. So in the 6th century, the architects and sculptors of the Chalukyan period, uh, patronized by the kings, decided to create these cave temples. This is after Ajanta. And on the walls of the cave temples, you have these fabulous carvings. This is Nataraja, as everybody knows. And multi-armed Nataraja, a very multi-armed Nataraja. But I just want you to see this gap over here, and this gap here, and this gap there, when you can actually slide your arm into Nataraja, so to speak. So this is a kind of a 3D thing, if you know what I mean. So when this artist envisioned in his mind's eye that he was going to carve a Nataraja on the wall, he actually selected a stone that was protruding from the wall, and he didn't carve into it, he chiseled the pieces out so that this is a 3D Nataraja, basically. And then um, you have this Nandi peeping out at the back, you have Ganesha dancing, but look at this hmm, a drummer. Now, in, in the south, this looks like a tabla he's playing, only it's taller. There are two drums and a very relaxed pose and he's going to thump on both of them uh, to accompany Shiva. But in the south today, to the best of my knowledge, in the states of Karnataka and Andhra and in, and in Tamil Nadu, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't see dancers dancing to an instrument like this. We have the horizontal drums, we don't have vertical drums. So basically, these sculptors carved everything that they saw around them and didn't imagine uh, things. There are various other clues that we have. So there's a lot, a whole lot we can learn from. So this is another of the, of the caves of uh, Badami, and you can see these, these pillars. 
This is how the interior of the caves actually look. Madami is not as famous as Ajanta, I don't know why. So if you look at the first set of pillars, this is how you come in from the outside, very different from the second set of pillars, that's over here, the third set and the fourth set, each, each of them is uh, different. And please look at the ceiling. And the height would easily be about 17 to 20 feet up there, and they are carved. And let's look at what kind of carvings are there. So this is how the pillars look. And they have the grains of uh, sandstone over here. These are all sandstone uh, pillars, beautifully chiseled. You know, today you say, handmade this, handmade that, handmade ice cream. This is all handmade. I mean, they had some basic tools, a hammer and a chisel. We don't know what they had. But look at that perfection, complete perfection. This is on the ceiling. So you know, we, we know of art across the world is beautiful. We can't compare art from one region with the other, nor can we compare art of one era with another. We shouldn't do it. We really shouldn't. But then we think of Michelangelo and we think of the Sistine Chapel. This was in the 6th century. This is in our own front yard. This is on the ceiling of the Badami uh, cave temple. Now, which anonymous sculptor was there lying down on his back on a scaffolding and chiseling away and got the proportions and dimensions perfect. Can you imagine the amount of dust and stone that would have fallen into his eyes and into his mouth as he was doing it? He hasn't left his name behind, but this piece of art is there. But unfortunately, you know, most people go in and take selfies, they don't even look up. So this is also on the ceiling of uh, one of the cave temples of uh, Badami. Again, it's like a maze. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is how it is. And this is how the pillars are. Artisans chiseling away. And we can also think of how much employment was given. The, the economy of the entire place rose when a, when a king decided that this is what he would do. And it's not just the architects and the sculptors. It's the unskilled laborers who were cutting and people were helping them, making all these implements and giving it to them, etc. So this flower, this band of flowers that you see over here would be about an inch or an inch and a half in size. That's about it. It's blown out of proportion oh, 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 on the screen. And this is like an entire lotus that's opened um, on the pillar and on all sides. So this is another cave temple in Badami. So this is uh, uh, another temple uh, that we see in a place called Aihole. This is also in the Chalukyan territory, around, around the 8th century. And we would like to see how they are experimenting and taking things forward. They've left the cave tradition behind, and now they are making temples of uh, structural stone temples, putting stone upon stone upon stone. And this is a very different uh, kind of a temple with its back round like that. And in Indian architecture, in, in Indian architecture, we have a special word for this. It's a, it's a Sanskrit word and it's called Gaja Prishta. Gaja as in elephant, Prishta as in back. So if you view it from the back, it looks like the rounded back of an elephant. Isn't that sweet? So just bear this in mind till I take you to another temple and ask you to find out what that is. And not only that, here they were expect experimenting very clearly with the North Indian and the South Indian styles of temple architecture. Northern Karnataka is somewhere in between the two of these. So the top shikara is of the North Indian style, the Nagara style of architecture. And this base is very South Indian. So very close to Badami and Aihole, um, is another place. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The place is called Pattadakkal and this is where many of the Chalukyan kings had their uh, coronation. So what little of Pattadakkal you can see, you see. Uh, so this is, this is how it looks. And what's great about Pattadakkal is that some of the temples are of the South Indian style of architecture and some are clearly of the North Indian style of architecture sitting stones throw from each other. So this was a place where they were very clearly, very clearly experimenting uh, and this is the Virupaksha temple that looks like this. Um, this is, you could see uh, hundreds of these in Tamil Nadu. It's a very Tamil Nadu style of architecture. And th th this is how it is. A uh, Chalukyan king conquered the capital of the Pallava dynasty, which is in Kanchipuram. He chased the ruling Pallava king away. This was in the 8th century. And uh, he wandered around Kanchipuram. And he saw this magnificent temple called the Kailasanatha temple, fell in love with it, took the architect back to his place, Patadakal, and had him build for him 
a temple just like the Kailasanatha temple. And the original name of this Virupaksha temple was Lokeshwara because it was this Chalukyan king's queen, uh, Loka Mahadevi, who sponsored the building of this temple uh, because her husband had won a war against the brave Pallavas. Her name was Loka Mahadevi, so she called it Lokeshwara. And not to be outdone, her sister, who was also married to the king, built a temple right next to it. Her name was Triloka Mahadevi, so she called it Trilokeshwara. All right, so there are two temples and the Nandi is made of a completely different uh, piece of uh, stone. So the temple that's right next to it is called the Kashi Vishweshwara temple and this is completely of the Nagara or the North Indian style of uh, temple architecture. This is, this is how it is. Uh, to see a temple like this bang in the middle of Karnataka is very interesting. All right, now I'm happy this file wasn't corrupted. What you're looking at, can any one of you tell me what you're looking at? This is Ravana. This is on a, this is on a pillar that's only, uh, this is less than two feet in breadth. So this is Ravana shaking Mount Kailash. Now look at this brilliant artist. He is showing us Ravana's back. Because he's got so many heads, you don't know which the front is and which the back is. So this is actually the back. And uh, he's not able to lift Mount Kailash, so his feet are sinking into the sand. He's unable to hold Mount Kailash. And this entire thing is Mount Kailash. And that's Shiva and Parvati right up there. Brilliant, because this is the space he had. And within that given constraint, he decided that he would make a Ravana doing this. So now we go, we come to Tamil Nadu. We are going to a place called Rock Fort. Yes. This was the Pattadakkal, the Virupaksha temple. Eighth century, sandstone. So now here we go to <coughs> a place called Rock Fort uh, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, right up there as you climb, it's very difficult to climb and as you're going to the top, you see this cave temple. This is 7th century and the difference here is that it's not uh, sandstone, it's hard granite. It's very, very difficult to climb and these steps are all very new. We wonder how these artists clambered inside and did this. So when you go inside, it's a Shiva temple, 7th century, Pallava dynasty. This is Shiva standing there and here he is Gangadhara. This is Ganga, unfortunately a little damaged. And you know that Shiva lets out a strand of his hair and Ganga comes in from the heavens, the river Ganga, and he lets her gently on the ground. So if you look at this sculpture, it's nice, it's very nice, it's 7th century. But there is an accompanying inscription over here and one must read this inscription, which only trained people can do. This is in Sanskrit and the script is called Grantha. It's a poem. I'm only showing you a bit of it. It's a very, very long poem written on either side of this Gangadhara panel. And the, the king um, in whose reign this, this uh, image was carved was Mahendra Varman Pallava, completely brilliant man, completely brilliant. He was also a poet, he was a scholar. So he authored this poem and he's written it over here. Though he doesn't specifically say so, people are able to find out that is Mahendra Varman's creation. And he says he wants to tell us something and this is how he puts it. I'm not going to quote, I'm just going to tell you a gist of what he said. It's as though he's putting words into the mouth of Goddess Parvati and she's telling Shiva, uh, mm, you know, you're sitting here on this mountain, this rock and Mahendra uh, uh, Varman is saying this, oh Shiva, you're sitting up on this, on this rock and there's this beautiful river Kaveri that's uh, running by and uh, now Parvati comes into the picture and she says, I have left my abode in the Himalayas and I've come all the way here, Shiva, O Gangadhara. Uh, I know you already have the Ganga over here and you're very fond of her. Now don't go eyeing this river Kaveri because she already belongs to Mahendra Varman Pallava. <laughs> Just to say that his jurisdiction extends up to the river Kaveri. It's a very nice way of uh, putting things across. So in the, in the time of his son and successor, Narsuma Varman Pallava, uh, in Mahabalipuram, which is very close to Chennai, mm, when the official name is Mamallapuram, it was the official name in the 7th century, it's the official name today. So I just want you to see the difference <coughs> in the pillars. Look at this rugged pillar, and now look at this pillar. Okay, so within a time span of about 30 years, things have changed like this. And you're going here to see a fabulous Varaha, 
sitting here, standing here, and this is the goddess Earth over there. Now you can look at this and come away, or you can look at something the sculptors have done. You're looking at this man, perhaps a rishi, whatever, almost fully turned in. You're looking at this man who is in profile. This man is in three-fourths profile. They've tried various kind of things, and this is granite, and that's only a little bit of it. Now, on the opposite wall, you see Trivikrama, that other uh, incarnation of Vishnu, where there's one leg on the ground, and the second leg goes right up there to the heavens. He's measuring the earth with one leg, and he's measuring the heavens with the other. So again, we can say, oh, yes, I've recognized Trivikrama and come away, or oh, we can do one thing. Look at that. The leg actually goes behind the four hands. So you have the thigh here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and the toe sticking out over there. So did this man carve the leg first, or did he carve the hands first? And he must have thought this out before he actually put chisel to stone, right? And on this side, he holds a sword, which goes in front of this hand, and in front of this hand, and at the back of that hand. Plus, he wants to, he's dying to tell us something. He wants to tell us, that this Trivikrama's leg went like way above somewhere, um, a place that we cannot even imagine. And that place that we cannot even imagine is above the sun and above the moon, that's all we can see, right? So there you have Surya. You can see the round around him. And over here, look closely, can you see a part of the disk over here? So this is Chandra. So this has gone over Surya Loka, it's gone over Chandra Loka. So where has it actually gone? It's gone to Brahma Loka. And that's Brahma sitting over there. That's supposed to be way, way, way up there. So there's so much, so much to see. We can ignore this person, or we can choose not to ignore this person. This is the best known bear in uh, Indian literature. Who's that? Jambavan comes in the Ramayana of Valmiki. But if you know your Indian tradition, I'm not using the word mythology, if you know your Indian tradition, you would know that this Trivikrama incarnation comes way before the Rama incarnation and the Jambavan bear is sitting there in the Rama incarnation. How did he go to the Trivikrama one? But this Jambavan is supposed to have been an ever-living bear. He was around then and he was there. And he says in the Ramayana to his monkey friends that, you know, when Vishnu came as Trivikrama and he, he measured the universe, I was there. And I went round and round him playing a drum. And that's what is shown over here. So, you know, these temples are actually, we can look at it as a sculpture. It's a beautiful sculpture. And the thought that went into the mind of the sculptor who chiseled all this, you can also understand that these are repositories of our ancient literature. And if you know your literature, you can identify this better. If you don't know your literature, you can go back and become better at that because you want to know what this is. Is it a monkey? Is it a boar? Is it a bear? And what's it holding in its hand? So you can go back and read up on it. So, and this is again a, a fabulous, fabulous sculpture. You can also, you can all see Lakshmi and it's not the usual Lakshmi who is sitting in Padmasana that you see everywhere. This is a one-of-a-kind Lakshmi that you will not see anywhere else. So this is an elephant that's pouring water on her head. So this elephant is pouring water. And look at the pot that's poised right above her head. And then after he's done pouring all this water, this elephant, which has wound its trunk around this pot, is going to take this pot of water up. And this elephant is going to bring his trunk down and take this pot of water up. So this is actually an animated panel that you are looking at. You talk of animation, animation these days, 7th century animation. All right. And this is Durga. This is a man. And th these temples are clearly reflective of the society of those times. And what this man is doing is actually cutting off his own head to offer at the feet of Goddess Durga. This was done at that point of time. I won't go into the reasons. Mini and animated thing. All this is in Mamalapuram, 7th century granite Pallava. So you come to this place, they got sick and tired of, you know, cutting into rock and making a cave temple. They, they're just tired of it. They've done dozens of them. So they said, now let's not cut in, let's cut out. So they saw huge, they saw a huge rock extending from there to here. And this is where our Prime Minister was with his Chinese counterpart uh, a few weeks back. And each of this is a monolith. All right? Each is one piece of stone. This is one piece of stone. That's for Durga. So her line is there. This is another piece of stone. 
The each is different in dimension, each is different in uh, proportion. They are all sadly unfinished. And this one is a masterpiece because from top to bottom, it's a monolith. Can you see this gap here? And then there's another gap over here. They were chiseling from top to bottom. We build from bottom to top. But when you cut, it's the other way around. And they had managed to make a sanctum over here for Shiva. There is, in fact, a gap where even today, with special permission, you can go around. And then there are stairs leading to the middle floor. There's a sanctum, and you can go around. They were planning to make another sanctum here with an enclosure around. So if it had been completed, and unfortunately it wasn't, what you would have done, even now, is to go here, worship, go around, take a flight of stairs here, worship, go around, take stairs there, worship, and go around within one piece of granite. And that too in the 7th uh, century. And meet half of King Narsuma Varman, the person who sponsored uh, the, all of this. Now here you go. Didn't I tell you about a Gajaprishta temple? So this is like uh, the back of an elephant. And they decided that you should understand in the 21st century. So they took two pieces of stone sitting next to each other. They carved one into a Gajaprishta temple. They carved the other into a back of a Gaja, facing the same direction. So without the aid of an inscription, you would easily understand that this is that kind, that model of architecture. Pretty brilliant. And even if you didn't know all of that, it's a nice elephant. But unfinished because if it had been finished, this matrix of stone in between would have been uh, chiseled out. Uh, elephanta. Uh, I'll just go through these slides a little fast. Just to tell you that in each part of India, where the texture, texture of the stone is different, um, the carvings are different. We'll, we'll come to this. Now here I'm taking you to a little known monument. It's in Tamil Nadu, but half the people in, uh, not half, Hardly anybody in Tamil Nadu knows about it. So this is a drone shot. Um, this is near the Madurai area. This is approximately 7th or 8th centuries. You're looking at it from above. This is a granite hill. And what they did so many centuries back is to cut like this. Three trenches, all right? And then this is what they did. It's fabulous. So this piece of stone that was left uncut in the center has been cut into a temple. All right? And this is, this is how it looks. And this is what was left incomplete. This is, these are all the trenches on either side. How difficult, how time consuming, how laborious. And uh, this is unfinished. This is what, in all likelihood, inspired the chiseling of the great Kailash temple in Elora, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site today. Or this may have inspired that, but it's more likely that that inspired this. So this is in Elora. Stone is completely different, so the sculpture, the mode of carving is, is also completely, completely different. This is Rashtrakuta uh, era. I'm taking you to back to Tamil Nadu. We are jumping centuries, we are jumping so many things, uh, places. This is the short temple, which is built of a stone called laterite, a very, very unsuitable stone for building something right next to the Bay of Bengal. So the salt-laden uh, air has been hitting against the stone for centuries, and this is, this is all you have. So slowly, slowly now, temples are going to get bigger and bigger, and they're going to give scope for all kinds of cultural activities. So this is a famous temple, the Kailasanatha temple which this king, Chalukyan king, fell in love with and took the sculptor back. And this is, this is how it looks. Now let's go inside and see how it is. Temples are becoming bigger. Temples are becoming grander. Uh, temples are getting more sculptures. And there's, can you see this paint on the face of this Narsimha? So this entire temple was completely and totally I, painted over. So this is one of the most outstanding Natarajas. And if there are any dancers in this audience, you would clearly understand how the temple was a cultural center. Not just that dancers dance there, but that people knew of this text called the Natya Shastra. Uh, Natya as in dance, Shastra as in science. Without knowing the nuances of that text, no sculptor could have carved something this perfect. You cannot ask a lady or a man to pose like this for you while you're sculpting. Cannot. So this man had internalized the Natya Shastra as he had internalized the Shilpa Shastra or the art of sculpting and out comes a piece like this. 
And then, okay, so this uh, is a very nice sculpture. Just imagine the leg of Shiva over here, and the other leg goes right up there, above his head. All right, now I want you to look at this, and we understand temples, this, this is the topic of today's lecture, temples as centers, cultural centers. Now, uh, culture as in literature, as in sculpture, as in painting, as in music, as in dance, so this king, Rajasimha Pallava, who, who patronized the construction of this temple, who gave money for it, was a person who was deeply interested in music and in dance and in literature. So he encouraged all the men of his land to contribute to this temple. Now this person who carved this sculpture was very influenced by a piece of literature uh, written about 100 years before his, 100 or 200 years before his time. Now the Mahabharata is a very vast work and we only know about the, the core of it. We know about the fight of the Kauravas and the Pandavas. But there are small, small, small stories there which we hardly hear of unless it's made into a brilliant uh, transcreation by a brilliant Kalidasa of the Shakuntala fame or by a little known but equally brilliant scholar living in Kanchipuram whose name was Bharavi. And he plucked this little known story from inside of the Mahabharata and he turned it into a gem. And that story is called the Kira Tarjuniyam. And that is a story of uh, Arjuna fighting with Shiva. He had actually meditated on Shiva to get a very powerful missile from him, which he could use against the Kauravas in the Kurukshetra war. And he had to perform penance on the Himalayas for months together. And finally, Shiva came to test him to see whether he was worthy of receiving this very powerful weapon. So Shiva comes in the disguise of a hunter and he sends a wild boar towards Arjuna. And Arjuna, being a Kshatriya, shoots at that bow. At the same time, Shiva also shoots an arrow at the bow. Both kill it at the same time and they start fighting. Is it your arrow that killed it or is it mine that killed it? So this is that tussle. And Arjuna is the one with the crown, he's the prince. And this is Shiva with a little uh, hairdo at the top because he's a tribal, he's a hunter. Now, you would never have a clue. None of us would have a clue that this is that story from the Mahabharata if you didn't see this wild boar at the back. Can you see that over there? So this is what this brilliant sculptor did. This story, this work was very popular in Kanchipuram. So he used that idea and put it in as a sculpture. So we, we again, we can do two things. We can try to identify this. Uh, when, you, when you look at a sculpture, you have to look very keenly. You shouldn't just glance at it and go away. That's not, that's not the way it is. So what is this thing? If you stand on this side and take a photograph, you'll clearly know that this is a wild boar. And what is a wild boar doing behind Arjuna? Look at that. One leg is in front of the bow, the other leg is behind the hunter, juxtaposed. Very nice. And the, and the temple was a great center of painting, the murals here. All this dates from the 7th century AD, but much of it is, is gone. Now this is an absolute, absolutely brilliant temple, completely sandstone, 8th century, Kanchipuram, Pallava era. It's called the Vaikuntha Permal temple today. It's a Vishnu temple. This is how it is. It's in three levels. Um, it's a temple in active worship. So there are stairs from the inside leading from the ground floor to the first floor, from the first floor to the second floor. You can't see the stairs because they are concealed and that was in the 8th century. So the God is there and yes, people go to worship him. But those who do and they walk around this enclosure in a clockwise direction. This is the Pradakshina Pata. They sometimes look at the pillars, but unfortunately no one looks at the sculptures that are I that the, the sculptures behind the pillars, nobody looks at them. And if you do, there's another world opening up in front of you. Because these sculptures that you see are not uh, your random gods and goddesses. They depict, they portray the entire history of the Pallava dynasty from the very beginning up to the time and inclusive of the reign of the king who sponsored the building of this temple in the 8th century. So this is a coronation scene where a king is coronated. And then the rest of the sculptures will be all the events of his reign. And then he dies. The next king comes. He is coronated and that's how. So I'm just going to go through this very fast. Very interesting sculptures. So temples, that's again the topic here, as, as centers of culture in the sense that they are portraying the history of that era. And 
entirely, entirely. So let's not think of culture only as music and only as dance and only as painting or, or drama or whatever. There's so much more to, to culture. So there was this lady called Meenakshi who has written a book documenting each and every sculpture and I've taken it. So this is a king called Vishnu Gopa. He's sitting on his throne. And there are these, these different people in his court attending on him. And then we see a war scene and there's somebody thrown on the ground and there are horses. Ay, there are horses. So this is the king who's standing there. These are horses and elephants all fighting. Now, on purpose, there is a place that's left blank. It hasn't been chiseled out. This is no damage. This is a blank space left behind in the 8th century. Now, what could it indicate? So this historian delved into inscriptions and decided that this was the invasion of Samudra Gupta. We've all heard of Samudra Gupta from our history textbooks. None of us were told that Samudra Gupta took his army all the way to Kanchipuram. And the then ruling king was Vishnu Gopa, who was seated on his throne, and then he faced that war. And this is in Allahabad. This is Samudra Gupta's famous Allahabad pillar inscription that says that he defeated Vishnu Gopa. So, and the, so that was that blank space saying Samudra Gupta had devastated the Pallava army. There was nothing left of Kanchipuram, so one big blank. But the Pallavas got their act together. And um, this, these are some of the coins of Samudra Gupta. I'm showing you this because it's a very, very famous gold coin of his, which depicts a particular ritual called the Ashwamedha Yajna, which has a horse. Just to show you that when Samudra Gupta was doing this in the north, and he was very well known for it, in the south, the same thing, same time was being done by the Pallavas. Do you see this horse here? Okay. And he's tried to a sacrificial pole and there are people praying to him. So this is that horse. Same time, same time period. So how this Vaikuntha Paramal temple is actually a storehouse of political, cultural history? I'll come to cultural history. So it also tells you how this temple was actually built. This is a miniature of the Vaikuntha Paramal temple over there. Now, um, is there anything that any of you can tell me about this uh, panel? Is there anything that, that strikes you as being a little different? Looks Chinese? Absolutely. I'll show you the next one. Clearly Chinese. So who was this very famous Chinese traveler? Huan Sang. Can you tell me? I don't want to make this like a history class, but can you tell me which century this man came to? Seventh century. So which was the great king who, who welcomed Harshavardhana? Harshavardhana of Kanauj welcomed Huan Sang. And Huan Sang went to Nalanda University. That's they'll tell you in your history textbooks. But this culture on the walls of the Vaikuntha Paramal temple clearly tells you that Huyen Sang came to South India. He spent four years in Kanchipuram, and you can get, that, get that, those facts from his diary as well. So this is Huyen Sang in Kanchipuram. Kanchi was a very great center of Buddhist learning, and uh, as was Nalanda, and he came here, stayed here for four years, and learned all that he needed to learn, and then went back to China. Now, if temples, are, if temples are great centers of the arts, we cannot forget the metal images. And of the Pallava times of approximately the 8th century, and I've scanned this from a book by C. Shivaramamurti, this is Shiva. Whenever we think of Shiva, we think of him dancing as Nataraja. This is the rarest of the rare. I want you to see his palm, his outstretched right hand, and there's a blob of something in it. And that's the worst, world's deadliest poison. You know that Shiva swallowed a poison called the Hala Hala. That's the Hala Hala. So this image is called Vishapaharana. Visham is poison and Apaharana is to take. So this is just the front of a bronze image is very beautiful. The back is even more beautiful. So all this is made of a process called lost wax. Uh, can you imagine somebody making the whole thing out of beeswax with all the details including the tresses and including the hands and the emblems in his hands and all that and then coating it with uh, clay, a clayey soil and then making some holes in that clay, uh, allowing it to dry, showing it over fire so that all the wax comes out which is why it's called lost wax 
and then pouring molten metal, boiling metal, whatever, whatever metal you want, an alloy or gold or silver, putting it in through those holes and then that the whole image must fill up at the same time. You can't do the feet now and the hands later, that's not done. So the whole hollow image has to fill up at the same time and then the clay thing is broken and you get this. Which is why these are treasures because it's a one-off thing. And I have created this, and you want one of you wants another one just like this. I can't give you one just like this. I can try to make one just like this. It will not be the same. So that's, that's the beauty. I'm sorry? Uh, where <coughs> is this image uh, today? It's in the Government Museum, Madras. Egmore, Egmore Government Museum. It, it's on display, very much there. <coughs> the, the name of the image? Vishapaharana, V-I-S-H-A-P-A-H-A-R-A-N-A. -A -A -A. Two words, Visha, Apaharana. All right. And I'm sorry? The, from the Tanjavur area, not Tanjavur in particular, aroundish. Um, uh, so this is, uh, this is not from Tanjavur. This is from a place uh, called Kurum, which is near Kanchipuram. Now look at this and look at this. How, how much more perfect can it get? And I'm saying these people knew the Natya Shastra and they knew the Shilpa Shastra, they knew, they knew their, their metal, they knew the art, art, they knew many arts. Going to one of the best known temples in the south, this is the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur, 11th century, uh, Raja Raja Chola. So if you want to get information about temples, and this is another thing that temples uh, are known for, but Oh, oh, small groups of academicians know about it only. What do you think this is? These are copper plate inscriptions. And many of these copper plate inscriptions contain information. These are basically royal documents. I am, I am Raja Raja Chola and I want to donate something to this group of very nice people who is listening to a very boring lecture. So I want to give you all the land that's around this museum. So I can't give it to you on a piece of paper. So I have to write it on a sheet, several sheets of copper and I have to put a hole through it, I put a ring uh, through it, and then I give it to you. So this is your permanent document. This is for you, your children, your grandchildren, everybody for keep. So if I, Raja Raja Chola, want to give something to a temple, I would write it on another copper plate inscription and give it to a temple. So temples are also storehouses. This cultural center must have everything, not just dance. We can, shouldn't think of only music and dance. So. I'm showing you this particular inscription. Uh, it weighs 92 kg and it has 31 copper sheets and this is how it looks. This is from the reign of one of the greatest kings of India, Rajendra Chola, 11th century. And this has a lot of old script. This is the Grantha script, uh, Sanskrit language. It's like you're opening a spiral notebook. So half of that spiral notebook is in Sanskrit, the other half is in Tamil, which is the local language. And you just flip through it and you can read it. And then I have to show you the seal. Now this is a very interesting, uh, I'll show you a better seal. So there's another one that's even heavier, 111 one, one kg, all right? So this is how it looks. Very difficult to lift. And now this is the seal. Very interesting and all, many of these were found in temples, okay? So the seal, the, the emblem, the royal crest of the dynasty of the Cholas was a tiger, okay? It's difficult to think of this pussycat-like thing as a tiger, but just, no, it's a tiger. Okay, and in front of the tiger are two fish. Now, the emblem of the Pandian dynasty, who were the deadly enemies of the Cholas, were the two fish. So, basically, this, this insignia is trying to tell you that the tiger had eaten up the two fish. They had defeated the Pandyas. That's the message you have to get. And then, this is a wild boar. Please understand, you're looking at something that's 1,000 years old and damaged. So the wild boar was the emblem of the Chalukyan dynasty. So the tiger has done away with the wild boar as well. All right. So this is the royal umbrella. These are the fly whisks. This is the, the traditional lamp of, uh, of uh, Tamil Nadu. This is supposed to be the royal throne. The swastika is a symbol that's uh, uh, very auspicious. And I'll, I'll tell you why it's an inverted swastika. Then there's a lotus, which is again a very uh, symbolic of all prosperity. There is a drum 
to, to proclaim the greatness of the Cholas. And around this is, it says, Etat Rajendra Cholasya Shasanam. This is the royal edict of Rajendra Chola. Now this could be used as a chap. And that's when the swastika would come out mm, in its proper way. All right? So this is heavier still, and this weighs 150 kg. Um, and this was also very recently, just about three, four years ago, found in one dilapidated uh, temple. All right? Now, coming back to architecture, the way they built these temples is amazing. This goes to a height of 60.96 uh, meters, approximately, and the inside of it is like this. We don't realize when we stand outside and gape, and, and, and the tourist guide with whom you go will tell you that the shadow of this uh, thing doesn't fall on the ground. And we are a non-thinking people. So we say, yes, the shadow doesn't fall on the ground, and we're actually standing in the shadow of this whole thing. How can, the sh how can the shadow not fall when the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? The shadow falls. Long, long shadows do fall. But this is a wrong thing, and it's there in all the history textbooks across India. Check it. So this is not, this is not a completely solid thing. It's completely empty. And the way they created this was to make this a storehouse um, of the arts, a cultural center. Everything is empty up to there. Can you see this narrow space here? It goes, this is an enclosure. You can go that side and come out. And it's in two levels, all right? So, the, um, so the, this is how it looks from the outside. I just pass through this a little fast. I brought one too many slides. So <clears throat> the lower enclosure that's around the main sanctum has these sculptures. And look at the, this is the ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India has done this, number one. And then you have 52, 53, 54, it goes in a row. So the Nati Shastra of Sage Bharata in approximately the first century AD has given a list of 108 dance movements, not a static dance pose, but a dance movement. And each of these is a dance movement taken from the Nati Shastra and portrayed here. Now Raja Raja wanted his sculptors to have all the 108, but unfortunately work stopped at 81. These are the ifs and buts of history. So these are just there from the Natya Shastra of Bharata. These on the upper level, these are the paintings. You're looking at a painting that's 1,000 plus years old. This also is from the Natya Shastra. It's called the Prishta Swastika. There's a particular name uh, to this. Looking at the back of a dancer, just look at that. And all these are old, old paintings and these are all fresco. This, this was done on the wall when it was still wet. And you may, have heard, you may have heard of a place called Chidambaram, where there is a temple for Nataraja. This is a rare, rare painting of Raja Raja and three queens worshipping Nataraja inside the Chidambaram temple. And the Chidambaram temple is known for its golden roof, the golden top. And even that is over here. Now, I'm only showing you one section of this painting. And how temples help historians to a very great extent is because I don't have the rest of this painting. The painting does not have what the temple has today by means of other enclosures and compound walls and the entrance gopurams and all that, which only means that in Raja Raja's time, all that wasn't there and it was added to in the later centuries. There's a lot of work. And this is supposed to be, though we don't know exactly, Raja Raja himself and his guru over here and various paintings. These are later paintings on the ceiling, on pillars, what have you. Inscriptions on the walls of this temple. It keeps going in and out. They tell you many things. They also tell you that 400 dancers were appointed by Raja Raja Chola to dance in this temple every day. Dance and sing and do all kinds of activities in the temple. And they were, it's a beautiful Tamil name. They were called Thali Pendir. Thali is temple and Pendir is lady. So the lady of the temple. Now you can also read this as a Devadasi, but not the Devadasi of later days, which tarnished images. These inscriptions tell you that there were 400 of them. They were given two streets to live in, each street having 200 houses, and the terms of appointment, terms of retirement, and the kind of honors that they were given, the, the remuneration, the honorarium, they were paid to dance in the temple. All kinds, their names, the 400 names are there inside. And this is how um, archaeologists copy these inscriptions, incidentally. So this is a temple in a tongue twister of a name place, which is called Gangai Konda Cholapuram. And this is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
completely built of granite when there's absolutely no granite anywhere in the vicinity. This is taken with a zoom lens about, about 40 feet up. So, you know, do you think these sculptors ever thought that people are going to come and take a photograph and show it to a nice audience in Mumbai on the evening of the 8th? He didn't, but yet the perfection, completely and totally. Look at, look at this sculpture. So this is a rare sculpture of Shiva with Parvati. He's winding, a, it's not a snake, it's a garland that he's winding on the head of a devotee called Chandikeshwara. Now, look at the expression of Shiva. I want you, you know, jewelers must go to temples. That's where they can get ideas. So look at, look at what Shiva is wearing over here, that necklace. And look at the chain, the chain, just look at it, comes in front of that, of that necklace. And it goes over his sacred thread. And there's a pendant over here. And every little detail is shown. So his earrings, this. And look at her ornaments. They are very different from his. You can go there. You can make a PhD. I'm giving you a topic. Any one of you wants to do it, study the ornaments in Chola sculptures. Nobody's done it till now. And then this is, this is Saraswati. Uh, you, you, you always see Saraswati with the Veena. This is pre veena days. And that's how Saraswati was shown in Indian, Indian, Indian art. And uh, look, at, look at what she wears, all of that. And the sacred thread that she wears, a sacred thread is, is a very light um, cotton. And they've shaped it along the contours of her body. It twists and turns and it twists and turns. Every little attention to detail is passed through this a little fast. Just to tell you, approximately when the Cholas were doing all of this, this fort was being built yeah? in Jaisalmer. And this was being built. We all know of this, but we don't know of different things that happen in corners of Gujarat and Bengal and the south, etc. At the same time, many of the temples of Orissa in the North Indian style of architecture, the Nagara style of architecture were being built. And these temples were also, this is a random uh, thing picked off the net because I didn't have palm leaf manuscripts with me. But you see, all these temples were also great centers of learning. They studied the Vedas and they studied grammar, they studied logic, they also studied veterinary science inside the temples. We have inscriptions saying so. So if you are going to be a student or a teacher in an educational institution, the next thing you need is a library. So all these temples had libraries. We have enough inscriptional evidence for that. And instead of the books that we have, they had palm leaf manuscripts like this. And we also have the names of some of the books that were, that were some of the manuscripts that were stored in these libraries. Going back to Tamil Nadu, taking you to a 12th century Chola temple. In another, this is UNESCO World Heritage. This is in a place called Dharasuram. And the front of the temple is shaped like a chariot. Now we know that the best known temple in India that's shaped like a chariot is the Konark temple. This was 100 years before Konark. And a particular Chola princess called Rajasundari got married to a prince of the Ganga dynasty of Orissa. She went there and with her went some architects and sculptors. And the tradition of making a temple like a chariot went from Tamil Nadu to Orissa. And uh, that's, that's how the beautiful Konark temple came. So look at these wheels. Go into this and we'll see how a temple was a cultural center. So you're looking at these pillars where you have these miniature um, carvings of dancers and musicians, clothes, ornaments, dance poses. I don't know how well you can see it from there, but this is a drummer. This is about a few inches in height. And this drum actually hangs from his shoulder. Can you see that cord over there? And uh, he's holding the drum with one hand and he's scraping it with a stick with the other hand. Now this is a drum which is called an edekka. And it is played in Kerala today. It's a very famous instrument in Kerala. But in Tamil Nadu it's not there anymore. But obviously a very famous drum in Tamil Nadu at that point of time. Steps leading to the sanctum have also been carved with images of musicians and dancers. They're all gone now, but when it was freshly built and painted, you can imagine how it would have been. And look at this. This is a Chola bronze, you know. Uh, this is, as you, stunning, uh, 11th century, uh, Ardhanarishwara. I, I want to show this to you in uh, detail. So this is a half man, half woman. That's clear. Anatomy. Now, follow it from the top. So this thing seems a little lopsided. This uh, sculptor hadn't made a mistake. He wanted it to be that because this is Shiva's crown, this is Shiva's matted locks on one side, 
It's Parvati's crown on the other, and they cannot be perfect. So this is his hair on one side, her crown. And the face, mm, I can't zoom now, but if you really go into the Madras Museum and you stare at this image, you'll find that Shiva's face is ever so slightly bigger than Parvati's. All right? And notice the different earrings. That's Parvati's female earring and that's Shiva's male earring. Look at the shoulder difference. Um, Shiva has four hands all together, so he's shown with two. Parvati always has only two hands, so one half of her is shown with one. Then you look at the waist and the hips and, and the legs uh, and even the feet. There's a big difference. Now, what is really amazing here is that Shiva is leaning to this side, as though he is leaning on his Nandi. And uh, obviously, this side is heavier and he has one arm more than Parvati, so this side is bound to be heavier. And if this sculptor, the, if this brilliant sculptor had made it just like that, it would have toppled to one side and you have to keep putting it back. You can't do that to a god in worship. So the thrust of the hip of Parvati is on this side, so that the center of gravity would run through. And then the back. Can it get better than this? And she wears a full length costume and he is a, he is, he is a sannyasi, like, so he has only a half length uh, dress. And Shiva's matted locks are visibly longer than Parvati's, okay, because he's unkempt, he doesn't care how it is, and this is the face. All right, and um, so these are the strands of his hair and this is her very bejeweled crown over here. Can you, can you see the pupils of the eyes very clearly? So that in, in a temple, uh, a temple was filled with cultural activities. That's why it was a cultural center. And one of those activities was a particular ritual. It's called the Netron Milanam. Netra is eye and Unmilanam is to open. The opening of the eye ceremony is what it's called. So I am the sculptor who made this image and uh, it would only be a piece of metal for me and for everybody else, you know, you, you could have a cat walking over it, you could, you could do anything. And then it was taken into the temple and on the day of consecration, what would happen is, and it's still a ritual that's being followed, the image is kept over there, uh, the door is closed and in front of it is a mirror, big mirror and lots of fruits and flowers and all kinds of offerings are kept. And the person who has made the image will actually bend over from the back and cut open the pupil of the eye. Till then, only the eye will be there. That round will not be there. So it was just a metal thing. And when you cut open the eye, the God sees. And that's when it becomes a God. And when he sees, he's not to see you and me, he's to see his own reflection. So that is another thing that happens uh, in, in a temple. Look at this. This is a trishul of uh, Shiva. You know, he carries a trishul. But this is an artist who has made it. So he's made the trishul meat over here. And in several temples in Tamil Nadu, the trishul, the sulam as, as they call it, is a deity by itself. Now you saw a plain, this is a very plain one. If it's, that's why I showed you this first. And then this has a Shiva leaning, it's, it's, the whole thing is only this big. And this is the, about the size of my uh, finger. Uh, this is like, look at the intricate thing. And he's leaning on his bull. Now this is a Trishul from a Kali temple. And this is Kali right there in the center. And, and uh, Kali is a very fierce goddess. So all this is there. And look at this, this is glorious. All of this is in the lost wax process and all of this contributed to the, to the glory of a temple. And each Nataraja obviously is very different because I cannot make one like the other. These are all there. Look at this one, rarest of rare, it's in the Tanjavur Museum. Look, look, at, look at how Shiva's worn his hair over here. This is the imagination of the artist and if this didn't make a temple a cultural center, nothing else, nothing else did. So now here's something very interesting. This Rajendra Chola in the 11th century with his capital down here somewhere sent, this is a very inaccurate map by the way. Uh, so sent his army all the way to Vangadesham, that is the Pala Empire in Bengal and he conquered the then Pala ruler and his army got back this image. So this is a Pala bronze uh, from the 11th century that is in worship in worship in Tamil Nadu today. I wish I could zoom, but look at how, look at the feet of Shiva resting on the back of Nandi. You don't see anything like this in the rest of India, in Tamil Nadu. And look at this pose 
where the heel actually touches the sole of that foot over there and there is a square inside the, sh inside the leg of Shiva. So this is called the Chatura Tandava. Chatura means a square. So this is there. And multi-armed and one arm comes right down over here. Um, these are all the devotees of Shiva singing and dancing and playing musical instruments. This is one of the most outstanding. So you bring it from one part of the country to another part of the country and it's in worship even today. So that's, that's something. We go, uh, I haven't shown you much of the north yet and this is a place that's not much visited. It's in Rajasthan and it's very close to Jodhpur and these are the kind of temples that you have here. Very sandstone very different from what you have uh, in, in, in the south. And that's from, we go to Modera in Gujarat. And I'm showing you a temple tank. I'm showing you a temple tank because it's so important that you can look at a temple tank as a place of ritual, a religion, and all of that. But these are also water harvesting things. You know, a temple tank was me meant to keep as much water as possible during the monsoon months. And we don't look at it like that. So temples served other other things. Uh, uh, so let me let me go through these slides very very fast because I brought more than I can do. Temples of Orissa, uh, very Nagara style of architecture, but they were also experimenting with toranas like this, which you saw long long ago in the Sanchi Stupa, and the Wheel of Konarak. Uh, it came a hundred years away from South India, but these are some of the best of the best. Of the best. I want you to see each drum. This drum, uh, look at what he's done. He's put his fingers inside the strap over here, okay? And then this drum is different. So basically, these are like photographs from the 13th century. And this is it a plethora of carving. Um, and then these two drums are also very different. The same one that you saw in Tamil Nadu with a strap hanging from his shoulder. Uh, Polatum dancers goes like this. I want to, you to identify this giraffe. Can you see a giraffe here? We know that it came from Africa, obviously. So we are talking about cross-cultural uh, relations and how a temple actually recorded everything that happened in the past. A giraffe was brought to a king of Kalinga, Orissa. Why, why, when, who, we don't know, but there's a giraffe over here. And the people of, uh, of Kalinga obviously saw a giraffe in the 13th century. Everything, everything has been recorded. We go to Khajuraho. Now, why do we think of Khajuraho only in terms of erotic sculpture? And what is wrong in erotic sculptures? A temple is actually meant to be, we have a thought process that's very different from that in ancient and medieval India. So they said a temple is a miniature cosmos. It's a microcosm of the macrocosm. Everything in the world is here. The main god, the side sub-deities, plants, animals, giraffes, cows, elephants, everything. Also erotic sculptures. Part of life, part of nature. It's there as well. But then, less than 25% of the sculptures in Kajura who are erotic, there's much more. Um, I'll just go through a few more and then I'll stop. So we're going to this temple made of soft stone. It's called chloritic schist. And it's in Karnataka, it's in Halibid, uh, which is about three hours from Mysore. I want you to see, this is a lintel that you, we, we are going in. And this is Narasimha in a bad, bad mood with Hiranyakashipu on his lap. He is wearing, uh, I can't zoom now. Uh, oh, I can, okay. So I'm wearing, he's wearing this mala, this garland, which is actually the intestines of Hiranyakashipu. Okay. The intestines of Hiranyakashipu. And that's, that's the demon prostrate on his lap, and he's having one, one iron grip, uh, an iron grip on one of the legs. And this whole thing is on the shoulders of Garuda. And these are the feathers of Garuda over here. Um, and I don't know whether you can see this, these circles over here. Now, inside each of these circles is something. Do you see a fish? Do you see a tortoise? Do you see a boar? That's Dashavatara. The Matsya Kurma Varaha goes up and Rama, 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 and then that's Kalki. Now, did you see a horse here? If you look very. So <clears throat> the, he wears a Dashavatara as a halo. All right, so this is that. Now, this temple again, very interesting. Yes. This is a temple, a Shiva temple in a place called Halebid. Uh, this is about three hours from Mysore. 
belongs to the Hoysala dynasty, and the stone is very soft, so it's easy to make and it's also easy to break, and it was broken during several invasions. Uh, there are 1,200 elephants people have counted, and each elephant is different. Uh, now, this is a war scene, and I want you to I didn't tell me something about this war. What, which war, what war could this be? The Kurukshetra war. If you're saying it's a Kurukshetra war, I would like you to tell me why you think it's the Kurukshetra, yes? Absolutely. So this is um, what I ask young students. So if you think it's, everyone says it's, Kuruk, it's a Mahabharata war. Yeah, right, but how did you know that? It could be a local war between the Hoysala king and his neighbor, no. So everyone will say this is Arjuna. So how do you know it's Arjuna? Because this is Krishna, his chariot. How do you know it's Krishna? Because it's Arjuna and they keep going back and forth. So then we understand that each of the heroes in the Mahabharata rode on a chariot and uh, to identify them when they were coming from a long distance away would be a flag fluttering on top of the chariot and each of the heroes would have an emblem on his flag said, oh yeah, that's Bhishma and then that's Drona and then that's Yudhishthira. So the flag of Arjuna had Hanuman the monkey and that's been carved over here. Now, many of the, the heroes of the Mahabharata are there in this war scene and they have their respective emblems and that's your homework, to go to the Halibut temple and find out what's where. Now, this Belur is a place that is very close to Halibut, same century, 12th century. So, this is, again, soft stone. If you think this is wood, you're mistaken. This is stone, okay? And uh, these are ladies that have been chiseled at an angle of 45 degrees. Um, think of this as a pillar, this is a ceiling, and an angle like this have been carved these very beautiful ladies called the Madanikas, and I, this is a pillar, incidentally. So if you zoom, you can look at the jewels, the anklets, the bracelets, everything that you need to know. Can you see that? Everything down to the toenail is carved. And what is great about the Hoysala kings and hats off to them is that they allow the sculptors to autograph the sculptures. So the name and uh, where he came from, a few more details are all over here. And the temples are also places where you can study what is called paleography, how scripts changed over the centuries, languages changed over the centuries. So I'm going to go very, 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 very fast because this, uh, could you, fine, I'm, Five minutes more. Could you, could, uh, Shiali? Just give me, um, do me a favor. Please scroll down to the very last four slides. We'll be done. I haven't shown you sculptures of wood. I've shown you stone. I've shown you paintings. I've shown you um, metal sculptures. So this, you've seen temple chariots and temple chariots. They are, they are a very colorful uh, thing in, uh, in South India. And this is how the processions are. But when they are stripped of all that, they look like this. And then if you look, go close, this is how it is. So these are mostly made of teak wood because teak uh, is termite resistant most times. Many of the chariots that you see, the, the temple ratas, are 500, 600 years old, sometimes older still. <clears throat> and this is the kind of woodwork that you, that you have over here. These are all parts of a temple chariot. And uh, uh, these people, you know, we have manuals telling you how you must cut wood to make a temple chariot. The tree must not be near the sea because then the wood would not be good. You should not cut a, a tree which is near a river because the roots are holding together the bund of the, of, the, of the river. You shouldn't cut a tree that's too young. You shouldn't cut a tree that's too old. You shouldn't cut a tree that's gnarled. And then you shouldn't cut before the rainy season. You shouldn't cut immediately after the rainy season. And what kind of axe should you use to cut? It should be buttered so that it could go into the tree trunk and it would come out. So these are the kind of sculptures that you have in wood. And these are all part of a temple. So whether you want um, stone, wood, metal, ivory, whatever material, you have it in a temple. You want inscriptions. You want information of music, dance, uh, jewelry ornaments, clothes, um, different types of uh, printing, uh, embroidery, it's all there. So basically, uh, it's a cultural center. It was a better cultural center. Any kind of information that you want is in there. It's for you to explore. Thank you very much.
So, we are just going to take three questions. Oh, there you go. It's entirely likely, uh, but I'm not the right person to ask because I'm a historian. Uh, it's very likely that the setting of a temple itself was um, in conjunction with the stars. So they absolutely no doubt that they constructed astrologers before uh, temples were being built, especially temples uh, where certain kinds of rituals would have to be followed for the general people to get rid of some of their doshas, etc., etc. But more than that, it was, it was the Agama Shastra. A Shastra is science, basically. So the layout of the, the soil testing was done, so many other things were done. But yes, I'm sure all this was done as well. Um, the last piece is actually a photograph I took in the Madras Museum very recently. Um, we don't know, it says locality unknown. Uh, we are not sure where it came from, but it was part of a temple chariot. And unfortunately, many temple chariots are fast deteriorating for lack of maintenance. Uh, yeah, so across India, we have literally thousands of inscriptions, and in each area, it would be in a regional language. And within that regional language, the scripts have changed over the centuries. So suppose, suppose you're a Tamilian and you, can, you have a triple PhD in Tamil, you won't be able to read an inscription that was written on the walls of a Chola temple. Yes, there are people who can still read inscriptions, but again, uh, they are an endangered species because uh, they're growing older and older and the younger generation doesn't want to take up this field of uh, study. It's very, very interesting. So, again, it's something that all of you can do in your uh, spare time. Mm, it's so nice to read something that's, that was written 1,000 years ago. But, yeah, the numbers are coming down. Okay, her, I'll repeat her question. She said some of the frescoes are in a very bad condition and cannot something be done about that. So I didn't have time to explain, but I will in just a minute. So uh, the frescoes that you saw on the wall of the Tanjavur temple have had a sad history. So Raja Raja commissioned his artist to paint these beautiful murals, these frescoes. Uh, that was in the 11th century. In the 17th century, another dynasty took over the rule of Tanjavur. They were called the Nayaks. And for what absurd reason they did this, we don't know, but they painted directly in fr on top of the Chola paintings, directly on top. And nobody knew about it till the 1950s when a, when a researcher saw the newer paintings flaking away and he saw another layer of paintings at the back. So he called the who's who of the world of archaeology and history and they scraped away some of the newer paintings and found that there was like wall after wall of Chola paintings from the 11th century. Since then, the ASI has been doing this profound thing of removing the 17th century paintings without damaging them and exposing the 11th century paintings without damaging them. But the damage that has been done has already been done. And this uh, temple suffered many centuries of neglect in between. Uh, so there was uh, leakage from the roof and all that, which is why now nothing, nothing can be done. It's best to conserve what is there and not try to repaint. It's not. In fact, uh, his, his question was, the Gangai Konda Cholapuram temple is said to be a replica of the very famous Tanjavur temple. It is not, and I underline it in red and I am highlighting it. So the Gangai Konda Cholapuram temple looks somewhat similar to the Tanjavur temple. And the Tanjavur temple goes up in straight lines like this. The Gangai Konda Cholapuram has a con concave shape very clearly. That's one difference. The second is that the Tanjavur temple goes up like square all the way. Now this temple is square at the base, and then it's octagonal, and then it's round. We make up all kinds of things. We are, we are a race with lots of imagination. So they'll tell you that, you know, this Rajendra was very jealous of his father, Raja Raja. Why he should be, I don't know. And he was jealous, and uh, so he tried to build a temple of the same uh, dimensions and proportions as his father, but he failed miserably. He fell uh, six meters short, because the base of both the temples are the same. 
the height of Gangai Kunda Chodapun is shorter. It was meant to be, it was concave, and then you had all these different concentric uh, levels. He wasn't copying his father. If he was, there's nothing wrong, but he didn't fail because this is a completely different model. I don't think all this, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think so, but it's subjective. I mean, I leave it to, to people's imagination, but no, it's a different temple with a different design. Okay, you are saying that you don't find Vishnu images in Shiva temples? That's what you're trying to say. Sharabeshwara. All right. All right, I, I'll come to this. So, there is this long standing uh, controversy in Tamil Nadu that um, while Shiva temples have images of uh, Vishnu, Vishnu temples don't have images of Shiva and that a Vaishnavite will not go to a Shiva temple whereas a Shaivite will come to a Vaishnavite temple. I've thought long and hard about it um, and I'll tell you the reason. So the, the reason starts from the later Chola times. Uh, this is my theory. So in the later Chola times, there were some Chola emperors who were very rabid Shaivites and who showed Vishnu in a very anti-light. Um, Vishnu plucking off his eye to offer to the feet of Shiva. And uh, then there is this particular image of uh, one of the manifestations of Shiva, where he looks like Narsimha, half man, half lion, but he is actually picking up Narsimha, who is dangling from his claws. And uh, Narsimha's devotee Prahlada is looking up at Shiva and said, please, uh, please, you know, kind of let Narsimha alone. It's a very grotesque image. And I'll ask you one thing. Suppose there's some, somebody you really loved, your father, your mother, your child, your husband, your grandparents. If you go to somebody else's house and, and, and they uh, start saying bad things about somebody you love very much, would you go to their house again? You wouldn't. You would avoid them like the plague. So what happened is, in a certain phase of history in Tamil Nadu, a, a, a certain era, not before and not after. There were some temples uh, that showed up Vaishnavism in a very poor light. And that if affected the followers of Vishnu very badly. Which is, which is why the tradition of Vaishnavites not visiting Shiva temples happened. And uh, I, th I think that came around after a point of time. So, the last question from that person there. So, the Mysore king? The Wadayar dynasty, I haven't touched upon them because it virtually comes to the modern times. Now, the Wadayars, because you ask, were the feudatories of the mighty Vijayanagara empire. And one of the wonderful things that they've carried forward from the Vijayanagara empire is the Dashara festival. And um, so many people go to Mysore during the Navaratri, the Dashara festival, because of the very grand procession. And that procession is a takeaway from the Vijayanagara Empire. If you go to the Hampi of today, this UNESCO World Heritage Site, in the center of Hampi, you will find a huge structure which is called the Maha Navami Dibba. It's a big platform on which the Vijayanagara Emperors seated themselves and they watched parades on the nine days. It's like a Republic Day parade, where the entire might of the Vijayanagara Empire, their horses, their, their elephants, the dancers and musicians were all paraded in front of the emperors. So that tradition was carried on by the Wadayar kings in uh, Mysore. Yes, another great dynasty for sure. So you didn't cover it just because I it didn't cover, I didn't, I didn't cover much. I covered very little. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra. And if you have any questions, please, she'll be around for another 5-10 minutes, so you can personally go and ask Dr. Chitra the questions. Thank you so much for staying and demanding the extra 20 minutes, half an hour. So just to tell you about the upcoming events we have at the museum. So we have the closing day panel discussion on 15th of November, which looks at traditions and how they've transitioned over time and what is the situation now today, like what are the Mithila artists doing with Madhubani painting, what are the artists with Goon painting doing and we are also looking at the Muchikam embroidery from Kutch. So we have three speakers who will be presenting on those, followed by a panel discussion. So it will be right here and then there are other uh, art activities and workshops like clay play. So you will all get a mailer from us 
saying a thank you and the upcoming events. And you must have received feedback forms. So I would urge you to please fill in your comments, etc., so that we know how to better organize such programs for you in the future. And thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. Thank you and good night. <laughs>